Um, first, I want to thank everyone for being here today supporting the Colorado Sun's first SunFest. We really appreciate our members and everybody else who's joined us here today um, in your support of our journalism. Um, I'm Sandra Fish. You might know me if you read the Sun as kind of a geeky politics person on the politics team, but when I'm not like working with data or something and following politicians around, I actually read books. And today I'm here with two local authors whose work I really admire. They're both journalists, former journalists, I guess I, they're still journalists, um, who've written about a past that I feel like we have not addressed much in Denver um, from 100 years ago that has been sort of swept under the rug over time. Um, Patricia Raybon wrote features and columns for the Rocky Mountain News and Denver Post, and I got to know her when she taught, we both taught journalism at the University of Colorado. She wrote uh, an award-winning memoir, My First White Friend, and continues to write essays and nonfiction and in some works of, about, about her faith. Um, but she recently turned to what she's calling history mysteries, and she's written two murder mysteries and it has another underway about the 1920s in Denver. Alan Prendergast has written for Westward, but he's also written for the Rolling Stone, the LA Times, Outside, and more. He's sort of made a name for himself here about true crime, and he'd previously written a true crime book and, and has a book out um, called Gangbuster that he delves into the controversial Denver district attorney. Um, and I'm really, thank you for, for doing this. Um, their fiction, nonfiction. Pat, I'd like you to start your series. To me, Hark, I've read the Maisie Dobbs mystery series set in England in which a poor teenage maid becomes a World War I nurse and then is like a World War, she's like a spy, she's a private investigator. And this sort of reminds me of those, but you know, set in the same kind of era, the 1920s, but here in Denver. So Pat, tell us a little bit about your book. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Fish. I'm not the only one in the room who calls Sandra Fish, right? <laughs> thank you, Fish, and thank you, everybody, who, for coming today to uh, spend some time with Alan and myself to talk about uh, Denver in um, a very curious era, uh, the early 1920s. And thank you for associating my book with this global bestseller, the Maisie Dobbs series. Uh, this is what I say when I'm at um, a bookstore. I was up in Loveland recently at the Barnes and Noble. And so uh, when people come in the door, I always say, do you like mysteries? And most people do. And so most people say yes. And then I ask if I can tell them about mine. And, um, and this is what I say, that it's a history mystery set in Colorado in the 1920s when the Klan ruled the state. At that point, people either know about it or they say, what? And, um, and so we're off and, and running. And so I tell them that this story features a, my little protagonist is a young black theologian who is also a Sherlock Holmes fan. And she comes home to Colorado to solve the murder of her estranged father. That's the, the first book. And I'll, I'll, often, Alan, that's enough for people to say, oh, I want to buy that. So. <laughs> Um, that was the first one. The second one, which came out this year, uh, is a same character, different uh, mystery. And she is solving the murder of a trick pilot 
before she gets framed by the Klan for the crime. And um, they are in the tradition of the Golden Age mysteries when the point of those stories was who done it. But what the uh, fiction girls or gurus are calling these stories now is why, why done it? Not just who did it, but why? So in this series, my protagonist is wondering why her, her down and out part-time black cowboy father is the target of Denver's white social elite and their clan associates. And that's the journey she's on, and that's what the stories are about. You know, Alan, you, I'm, I think that your main character is fictionalized in, in Patricia's novels. Um, tell us about, you are writing about Alan Van Sice. Philip Van Sice. Philip, uh, yeah, sorry. Philip Van Sice. He was the district attorney in Denver from, I think, 1920 to 1924. And he went after first the mob, used some modern day methods that I didn't realize even existed back then um, to take down the mob. And then he turned his sights to the Klan. Tell us about that. Yeah, I, I got the initial interest in this about 15 years ago when there was a debate in Denver over what to name the new Justice Center. And various names were proposed of various legal pioneers. And the name Philip Van Size came up. And I had sort of heard it before, and, and there was some fragmentary information sort of coming out then about why he might be a good candidate, but it was all very uh, scattered. And what little I did here was, well, as you say, I mean, he, he was a one-term DA. He came into office. He wasn't supposed to win the office. He was kind of a dark horse candidate. He was a war hero. He had also been a whistleblower at the Ludlow Massacre, which is what first brought him to prominence. He was a captain in the National Guard who tried to seek course marshals of other guardsmen who had, were involved in burning down this tent colony during a coal strike. Um, so he had that background, and then when he got into office, he found the city to be incredibly corrupt. The police were on the take. There was a guy named Lou Blanger who ran a national network of confidence men doing the long con in Denver. If you've ever seen the movie The Sting, the long con is something that takes weeks to do, many different players involved, and really involves fleecing somebody out of vast sums of money. And Denver was the capital for this in the 1920s. Um, he, and so the story, to me, was partly about an underdog who comes in, can't trust his own police force, uh, because they're on Blonger's payroll and getting a, getting a cut out of all of this. And uh, how he f improvises in ways to make his and make things work for him. And what he did, he had a background in military intelligence from World War I, was a, a new kind of surveillance, basically. He not only had agents following the, the con men around, but he planted a bug in Blonger's office. In those days, that would be a dictograph microphone hooked up to 50 pounds of wet batteries. <laughs> he, put it, he put it in the chandelier. Uh, so. Um, and so he, he actually built a tremendous case against these guys over a period of years, two, really 18 months or so, uh, without the police knowing about it, without the mayor knowing about it. When he arrested them, he put them in a, a church basement uh, rather than let them be, go to jail and be bailed out immediately. Turned, that in, turned the church basement into a jail. So he, incidentally, they named the jail after him here. So. Uh, but, and all that was intriguing enough, uh, but there was another second part of that story which was lesser known, and it had to do with what he did after that, which was taking on the Klan in Denver. And so well, the, the task I set for myself was to try to tell that story uh, in conjunction with the Conman story, because they're actually very related, both in the investigative methods he took up and in terms of what the Klan was really doing in Denver, which was kind of a massive con game of its own. <laughs> Sorry. You, tell us, both of you did some pretty intensive research. I mean, you're accurately portraying some interesting things that we don't talk much about that happened in Denver at that time. And, you know, tell us about some of the things, Alan. We've got your yeah. slides up here. 
Yeah, um, I mean, I, it's interesting. I mean, Patricia and I have different goals in these books. You, you've, you're, you're trying to get us into an environment where this character and this story comes alive and it's like real. I've got a real story that I'm trying as much as possible to make people forget the, it, so that it's not a history lesson and they can read it like a novel. But at the same time, everything has to be absolutely true. I mean, that was one of the things I set myself to do is no quasi-history, you know, no embellished dialogue or uh, speculation, what Tuckman would call, Barbara Tuckman, the historian, would call the must-haves. As he headed towards Elba, Napoleon must have thought back to that day where, you know, so yeah, he must have done that, but we don't know that he did that. Um, so I was really doing a lot of archival work, not just to set the environment, but to get to the actual primary sources. This is what alerted Van Sice in the first place to the Klan's presence in Denver. This was a letter sent to a janitor in Denver, uh, an African-American custodian telling him that he has to leave town or they're going to do something to him uh, because he supposedly had relations with white women. Um, Van Sice got a hold of this letter and was infuriated by it and basically made this vow about putting the Klan out of business in Denver. At the time, this is 1922, they were still a very shadowy group. They were sort of a quasi-fraternal order, and nobody knew that much about them. When he tried to put together a grand jury to look into their connections, their political connections, and who actually runs the Klan, uh, he was stonewalled. He, he basically, there was, a, there was a stockbroker he heard went to a meeting, put him, on, put him in front of the grand jury, and he refused to tell who was at that meeting, saying his oath to the society was more important to him than what some judge told him. So you can imagine the judge's reaction to that. Um, but eventually, he found out, next slide, please. This fellow was the grand dragon of the Ku Klux Klan for the Colorado realm. His name is John Galen Locke. He was a very eccentric figure, uh, uh, kind of, one, one journalist said that he was like he was living in the Middle Ages. He, he, uh, he was a homeopathic physician. Oddly charismatic fellow, he had a place across the street from the, what is now the Denver Press Club where he held court and saw patients and had a secret room where he did Klan meetings and things like that. Um, so, next slide, please. Um, Van Sice, after winning, after beating the con men, could have run for mayor, decided not to. This guy ran instead, an obscure bureaucrat named Benjamin Franklin Stapleton. And during the campaign, he was asked, well, where do you stand on the Klan and all of this? And he came up with this statement. He didn't mention the Klan particularly, but he said, true Americanism needs no mask or disguise. And sort of on the basis that he was not a Klansman, he became elected mayor. Uh, unfortunately, Stapleton was wearing a mask. Next slide, please. This is the official Klan ledger, which survives in Denver and is a great resource for researchers. I don't know how much you tapped into that, but it's interesting reading. Yeah. And it's now online. If you want to put a name in and see if uh, your great-grandfather had some connection to all of this, you can do that uh, digitally. It's, it's the History Colorado. Uh, but anyway, there's Stapleton's name uh, on that list at 430 William Street. And the number that he had there, he's clan, clan number 1128. It's a pretty high membership number, so he was clearly in the clan at the time of the race for, for mayor. Uh, next slide, please. When he was elected, this photo ran in the National Klan magazine. Uh, that's a single Klansman outside of Denver City Hall giving a sort of Sig Heil 10 years before there was such a thing, um, but basically telling his audience, we now run things in Denver. Next slide, please. Um, and this is one, uh, this is, just gives you some idea of how widespread, th th some of this is based off of people analyzing the ledger and figuring out where the Klansmen lived. And as you can see, they're pretty well distributed through central Denver, and even up on the northwest side where there were a lot of ethnic neighborhoods, um, uh, they're, they're pretty much all over the map. Uh, next slide, please. Um, eventually, they started coming out of the shadows. There were public parades. Uh, this is down 17th Street. Uh, next slide, please. And you get to up to 5,000 people at these meetings that happened every Monday night on South Table Mountain outside of Golden. Uh, there were uh, cross-burning speeches, bands, all sorts of things going on. At the same time, there were Klansmen on patrol on horseback guarding the perimeter, 
to make sure that no non-Klansmen got in. Van Size had five different undercover operatives attending these meetings. He was definitely trying to figure out how, what he could do with these guys in terms of criminal prosecution. Next slide, please. At the same time, I, I want to show like how this was getting more normalized at the same time. A picnic at Lakeside, bring the kitties, uh, 50,000 people attended this, 1925. Uh, next slide, please. This is the Women's Auxiliary, the women of the Ku Klux Klan, mostly a charitable organization. There's a baby there in the front. That's little baby Richard who was adopted by the Klan and dressed in robes and appeared at various functions. Next page, please. So Van Sys was getting these spy reports. These were an enormous resource for my book. If you talk about the research issues, I mean, the fact that these things survive, you can go down and read them at the Denver Public Library. They talk about all the crazy things going on at these Klan meetings. And Van Sys was getting all this intelligence fairly fresh after these meetings. Uh, next page, please. One of the things he learned from the spy meetings was that this man was very high up in the Klan. Uh, John Galen Locke's chief advisor, although I think he was mostly Locke was mostly dispensing the advice, not taking it. Uh, this is Clarence Morley. He was the chief district judge. Van Sy's clashed with him in court many times and learned that this, this was going to be Locke's choice to run for governor. In fact, he became governor in 1924. Uh, he's the only Colorado governor to have done time in Leavenworth after his two-year term, which was a complete flop. He went on to get convicted of mail fraud. Uh, next slide, please. What Van Sys did with a lot of this information was go to the press, since he couldn't trust the courts or the cops, who were very riddled with Klan. And he outed a lot of these people in the pages of the Denver Express. We can talk about the media in a little bit. And essentially, uh, this was one way of telling the voters before the election in 1924 that whoever they were going to vote for, at least they, hadn't, they, they were f fully warned about what their affiliations were. And as it turned out, the Klan swept those elections pretty convincingly. Van Sys managed to save a few judge positions with an, with an alternate slate of candidates, but um, uh, the, the Klan itself would collapse later. That's another story. The next slide. I'll just leave you with this. This is uh, John Galen Locke reporting to jail with his attorney. Um, this was in the last week of his office. Van Sys filed felony kidnapping charges against the Grand Dragon in connection with a very bizarre incident where they shanghaied a 19-year-old East High student and forced him into a shotgun marriage with the daughter of a Klansman whom he had impregnated. Um, Van Sys couldn't believe Locke was directly involved in that and tried to pursue these, these charges against him, which helped to sort of turn the tide. And I'll stop there, but I'll give you a sense of some of the research issues involved, yeah. Yeah, and Patricia, you... Your second book starts in the library. <laughs> and talk some about your research. And Kevin, we've got the di different deck. Thank you. While they're putting it up, I will um, provide context. Because I didn't ever call it research. I called it curiosity. inspired by that fight in 2008 to name the city jail after um, somebody who would uh, represent crime fighting in Colorado. But before all of that happened, I um, came to this topic because I was born under Jim Crow segregation. And I, um, would you do the slides for me? You can we'll keep. We'll see if that works. Maybe it doesn't. Okay, <laughs> can you just advance the slides? Born under Jim Crow segregation, I came of age during the Civil Rights Movement. Grew up in Colorado, spent 12 years in public schools before I went off to college, and never once heard anything about Colorado having a um, uh, Klan presence. Decades later, in 2008, when a naming committee came forth to recommend uh, Philip Van Sice as the uh, name that would be put on the city jail, 
um, I started reading the story, some of which Alan had written, about um, Van Sice's influence in trying to uh, fight the, Cl the Colorado Klan. And I remember thinking, what Colorado Klan? And so I, um, you can go ahead and advance the slides. Stop there. Um, I'm, this is here. This is Elizabeth Eckford. I'm sure you, many of you have seen this photo. She was one of the Little Rock Nine. And in fact, there's a woman in Colorado, um, Carlotta Lanier, who also was in the Little Rock Nine. And uh, this is the day that she, um, they went down, they were to go down as a group to the Little Rock High School. And this young lady, uh, who was 15 years old, her family either did not have a phone, which was not unusual at the time. I don't know if anybody remembers um, party lines. Anybody remember that? And, um, and I, apparently she didn't get the message, and she went down to Little Rock High School by herself and met this uh, crowd. And um, I show these slides. You can keep going. Because I um, experienced the water fountains, um, uh, Jim Crow water fountains in the South. My family and I would go down to the South during the summer. My dad was from Mississippi. My mother was from North Carolina. And I spoke last week at a high school, in uh, the Vanguard High School in, in Aurora. And I asked the students, what's the message of um, this uh, Jim Crow situation? And they were saying, you know, the message is that the people who drink out of the white fountain are better. And, uh, and so I said to them that my challenge with um, all of this effort, this writing, this work, these mysteries, all of this, was um, informed by the fact that I didn't know as a young child how to process living in an anti-black culture. You know, when I was five or six, I could read the sign, but I didn't know how to say, there's something wrong with this paradigm. And for a long time, I said, there's something wrong with me. And so um, I also didn't know how to process it, and I didn't know how to navigate it. And I, and I was always aw racially aware of the challenge of uh, being black in this world. So I didn't. When I read about Philip Van Sice, I didn't come to the information uh, in a random way. I was um, galvanized by the fact that Colorado uh, turned out to be, have the second highest Klan membership per capita of any state in the US. Uh, every county in Colorado had a Klan clavern. The elite, state leadership from the governor on down, county sheriffs, uh, William Canlis, who was the uh, member of uh, chief of the Denver Police Department at that time, had most of his st uh, police uh, troops and officers in, um, in the police department, school board leaders, jury commissioners, all over the state, and I was. Um, uh, fascinated that I had spent all this time here and hadn't known about this history. And so uh, once the, you, you can keep, uh, this photo, by the way, is, you would think was a, from World War II. This is actually a world, around World War I in California. So, you know, I share this because bigotry um, dies hard. <laughs> and you, you can keep, um, White housing covenants were in place all over the country, including in Colorado. Here's a sign from Park Hill. Do you know that Negroes are living on Glencoe Street? <laughs> you know, in Ivanhoe, and let's get together and protect ourselves. Um, here's another one, a promise that uh, when you buy a home site on this property, you will be forever assured of desirable neighbors. I remember meeting a woman one time, and she learned I grew up in Denver, and she said, what part of town did you live in? And as soon as she asked the question, I knew that she did not know about breadlining and how there was only one place I could live, my family and I could live in Denver. She didn't 
um, know anything about how the mortgage companies and the real, real estate business, the mortgage bankers, um, and if you Google redlining in maps in Denver, you can see specifically how um, people of color were uh, isolated in certain neighborhoods where there was dis disinvestment and, um, and where they were, we were prevented from living anywhere else. And so, um, if you, you can keep going, I think, yeah. So, when the stories came out about Van Sice uh, being considered as for his name to be used on the, on the uh, Denver jail, the new Denver jail, I started looking, that's really the long answer to the question, uh, Sandra. I started to look to see what was out there about this time. And I found Phil, uh, Phil Goodstein's book, In the Shadow of the Klan. Uh, this was an early, earlier one called The Hooded Empire. And also, Philip Van Sice's book itself on fighting the underworld. You can, uh, and then I started to um, go to the library, <laughs> physically go to the library. Do you remember? Um, Micro, when we'd go and use a microfiche, <laughs> remember those? And uh, so I would order these, go up and look through the indexes, order a microfiche, and start to look through um, this information. And then, of course, later, d during the pent, f fast forward 10 years later, um, 10 or 12 years later, w during the pandemic, I would go online and look at the Denver Public Libraries digital collection. And the photos were uh, just amazing. So much information. I also fell in love with a site called coloradohistoricnewspapers.org. There's a similar one called um, the uh, color, uh, called newspapers.org, which is associated with um, ancestry.com. And it, 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 they allowed you essentially to look at newspapers page by page. I'm sharing this one, for, for example, is um, making fun of a, a bootlegger who tried to defy the Klan. This is Estes Park newspaper. Papers all over Colorado had a lot of pro-Klan uh, sentiment in them. You can keep going. Uh, the other thing that the Denver Public Library has, if you have, ever have time, is an incredible collection of oral history. Um, so, yes, oral histories. And one of them that is, uh, uh, really made an impression on me was a, a taped uh, interview of Otto Moore, who earlier was a lawyer working in Philip Van Sice's office. And Otto Moore was like a dog with a bone. He was after the Klan. And so he ended up being a um, named judge on the Colorado Supreme Court. He also worked um, for Norm Early, when Norm Early, if you remember that name, was Denver District DA, and didn't retire until he's 89 years old. I mean, this guy similar to his former boss, Philip Van Sice, was determined to bring down this organization that he thought was um, poisoning the atmosphere in Denver. And so this is some of the work that I just found myself fascinated with, and I think there are a couple of more slides. Um, I'll talk about that later. You can keep going and talk about this later, too. I was going to mention Colorado Statesman, uh, which was the black newspaper at the time. These papers um, d came, well, this actually answers another question. I thought I had another slide I was going to show you. And that was Spike, the, from the movie poster from Spike Lee's movie, uh, Black Klansman. Did any of you see that movie? Um, so. A varying a source of material, everything from the Denver Public Library to a Spike Lee movie, 
inspired me to learn as much as I could about what had happened in Colorado in those early years of the 1920s. You know, can you talk, I mean, we're journalists, there are some mm -hmm. other journalists in the room. Can you talk about, and, and I think it's interesting that you grew up not knowing this, how did journalists of the day cover this activity? Well, Alan's gonna talk about that. Um, I showed that one slide of something called the Denver Express. The Denver Express was the smallest of the four daily newspapers in Denver, and it was the one Van Size went to to leak the intel, uh, because the, the Rocky Mountain News was, had clux, cluxers in management, uh, the Denver Post was a very erratic, I, I think you'd say, <laughs> the, 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 the Post uh, at one of these meetings Locke bragged that he had taken Henry, Harry Tammen, one of the pu publishers of the Post, out for a ride and made him a Christian. Uh, and he also claimed that he had made bond fees for Tractor Story. So the Post was not reliable for a number of reasons, even though it was the dominant paper in the region. And uh, as Patricia pointed out, I mean, a lot of smaller papers were totally pro-Klan, and they were, the Klan had its own newspaper. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it would be possible to have your own echo chamber if you were, if you just read the Klan literature in the early 20s, you would think that, you know, the Pope was trying to take over the world. There were all these conspiracy theories involving Jews, Catholics, blacks, immigrants. Um, and, and, and this was part of the propaganda they were disseminating. Uh, some of this stuff was was resuscitated from other places. Uh, the bigotry never really does go away. I mean, uh, the, in 1920, Henry Ford started publishing this 91-part series about a Jewish conspiracy. It was it was a rewrite of the Protocol of the Elders of Zion, which was you know this anti-Semitic tract from Tsarist Russia in the 19th century. Um, so I mean, all this stuff was happening at the same time. Um, but in general, the media was not in a position, I mean, most of it really stayed away from the story, which is part of the reason, if you're growing up at that particular time, you probably didn't hear much about this. Um, there, were, there were some attempts after the Klan had fallen apart. I, I remember there was a series in the Rocky Mountain News in the 40s, that was the first one I found, that really tried to deal honestly with what had happened with the Klan. Um, and then there was some other stuff, probably in the late 60s and early 70s. Um, but up until that point, no, and, and that ledger was buried in the Colorado Historical Society for many years. That book you showed, the, the first one about the Klan in Colorado, uh, Hooded Empire, the, Goldberg, the guy who wrote it, was a graduate student who convinced the Historical Society, let me look at this ledger. And they were saying, well, we don't know if these people are still alive, we don't, know, we don't feel comfortable with that. And he finally convinced them to let him use it, and he got so much demographic information about who the actual Klan members were in Colorado. It's, a great resource to researchers all over the place. But, uh, but at the time, no, the, the newspapers were not, for the most part, eager to do this. The, differ the difference was the Denver Express, which went out of its way to go after the Klan. And as a result, the editor got hauled before a Klan-packed grand jury. They were trying to inquire about his sources, who, of course, were Philip Van Size. Uh, Van Sice went into the grand jury room and physically rescued him from, from the, the Klan grand jury. Anyway. Well, my um, intrigue with all of this, in addition to um, thinking about what was in the paper, but what, what, what coverage of the Klan was going on, was looking at what, what was in the paper in general about race. And what I found were um, humor columns about um, darkies who dance. There was, a, there was a syndicated column called Dark Town that ran in papers all over the country and, all, and in papers all over Colorado that would show a little snippet of black life ridiculed with kind of a Jim Crow black language with a joke at the end. That was common um, newspaper um, entertainment. That was common. The other thing that was common were announcements of minstrel shows, the Lions Club, the, the United Methodist Church, the West High School. 
it, all, all of these people are, every weekend you can find a minstrel show underway somewhere, and not just in the 1920s, but uh, up into the 50s and 60s, people in black, blackface. Um, and so the idea that, um, as one analyst said, the idea was that darkies are funny, and, it, and if they, that's how they are shown in stories, that's must, that must be how they are. And either from a lack of imagination or lack of will, that was the, um, that was the um, atmosphere of the day. And so when people say that the Klan poisoned Colorado, actually, Alan says it very well, that the Klan, um, the Klan exploited the uh, fears that people already had about immigrants and uh, blacks and Catholics and, and, and Jews, the Klan struck that match and Klan fever took off. I mean, that's one of the really interesting things that wasn't just black people that they didn't like. Any Catholics, any people who were Jewish, you had to be a white Protestant from certain countries in Europe to gain their approval. It was Make America Great Again. <laughs> if, you read, if you read the um, Klan newspaper, which was the, Ro the Rocky Mountain American, which was published monthly in Boulder, by the way, um, the message that um, you see is that these are people who um, will leave us a mongrel race if we associate with them, if we intermarry with them. At the time, the um, anti-miscegenation laws were on the books in 38 of the uh, 48 states at the time, including Colorado. And, um, and so the Klan just folded in to what was already in the spirit yeah. in this, and so, it, um, that f is an important um, ag re important point for us in the state and everywhere to acknowledge. It's e the Klan is, uh, um, you know, easy to blame, but the spirit was in it, in the room anyway, yeah. and they took advantage of yeah. it. You know, I want to talk about how this applies to the present day. And Alan, 1924 was an election year. 2024 is an election year. And can you talk about the impact the Klan had then? And, and Well, yeah, what was interesting to me, I mean, it's, it's eye-opening, really, to see this develop so rapidly. I mean, again, but 1922, when Van Sys first begins investigating them, they're a kind of quasi-secret society. They're pretending to be a fraternal order like the Masons or something like that, but obviously they're, there's this white supremacy thing you really can't get around, and it's, it's only particular white supremacy at that. So, um, but, but within two years, suddenly they have this widespread support. How did that happen? And that's something I really try to get at a bit in the book. Um, and it has to do with, I, I think, you know, in a sort of, uh, the, I mean, the, the prejudice is certainly there. there. There are fault lines of paranoia and fear and things like that that they're tapping into. But there's also a certain contingent that w I would not call them true believers. I mean, they, they, they were opportunists, and they saw that as this group got to be more and more power that, that maybe there was something in it for them. This was true because the Klan was, the, the Klan in Colorado was not like the Klan in some of the other states where they went into massive vigilante actions. I mean, there were some efforts, that, there were some beatings, there were some intimidations, there were things like that letter to the janitor. But the Klan in Colorado, as a rule, was not as violent as, say, the Indiana Klan, where the, the guy running it eventually got charged with second degree murder and raped and mutilated this woman. Um, the Klan in Colorado was much cagier and much more adaptable and willing to change its message at a, at, at a given moment to, to attract more people. I mean, there was really, Locke was interested in power, 
And that's what they did over a period of a couple of years. They pushed economic boycotts. They, they, had, they encouraged small businesses to get involved. And it's like, we're going to protect you from these other people. They were you know, using these divisions that were out there um, to their advantage and trying to get white Anglo-Saxon Protestants to sign up uh, and, and saying there was something for them economically in that. And I think that was a very powerful weapon that Vance Ice had trouble. I mean, he, 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 he eventually was able to expose the extent of their influence, but they still won the elections. And they were very good at electioneering. They were not very good at governing, but they were very good at getting elected. You know, what lessons, Patricia, would you take away from that time that we should apply to the present? Probably the uh, most important one is to be aware. The, um, I was talking to, to my husband, uh, wave down my husband about that this morning. Um, yes, a lot of people were Klan members and a lot of people felt pressured to join, a lot of people, businesses and so on. If it existed at all in Colorado, it was because the, of the people who said nothing, who did nothing. And I think about uh, that Martin Luther King letter, uh, le uh, the Birmingham jail letter that said, you know, the problem isn't the people who are, are the, uh, doing this, the, the, who are the racists, the problem are the people who are standing back and watching it and not saying anything. And so for me, that is the lesson that we um, don't be Become part of those people. I think about the uh, Niemöller letter. Um, they came first. They came. You know, remember that poem? First they came for the uh, communist, and I wasn't a communist, and I didn't say anything. Then they came for the trade workers. I wasn't a trade worker, so I didn't say anything. Then they came for the Jews. Then they, you know, and he goes down the list. Then they came for the Catholics, and then the final stanza line in that poem is, "Then they came for me." and there wasn't anybody to stand up for me. And so, um, you know, it's a good lesson. I think st uh, poems still st taught in high schools, and I hope, and discussed. But uh, we are in this season of, of book banning and pushbacks on teaching history, and, um, and we can watch it, or we can become people who stand up and say something about it and, and do something about it. And that's the lesson. Yeah, I, I would agree that the silence was deafening. In, in, in a lot of, that's the reason a lot of the media, you didn't find this stuff in the papers. I mean, a lot of what was really going on. Um, and and, and there's so many overtones of what's going on now. I mean, I, I, there was a primary race where the Klan candidate for governor had to run against another, a very popular Republican rancher on the Western Slope. He refused to bring up that his opponent was a Klansman because he didn't want to give aid and comfort to the Democrats. You know, Van Seis was a conservative Republican. He watched his party get hijacked by these people, and he couldn't get these, he couldn't get the mainstream old style Republicans to speak out about it. That's very damning to me. On the other hand, uh, the, the thing I take comfort from looking at this sort of history is, I mean, the, the, the story of Van Seis resisting these guys is only one of many stories. I mean, there was a, there, there was a whole separate effort in the black community resisting the Klan, and when they burned a cross on the lawn of the NAACP leader, he responded by arranging the national NAACP convention in Denver, right in the face of the Klansmen. Um, and there were, you know, there were instances in the Jewish neighborhood and in the Catholic community of resistance to the Klan. A lot George, of these stories haven't been told. George Norlin, um, if anybody is a CU uh, graduate or know about George Norlin, he was pressured to, by the Klan to fire all faculty who were Jewish or Catholic. And he refused. And, um, and then the, the state legislature, which was heavily Klan, pulled funding from the university. And Norlin um, did everything he could to keep the university going. And so that's a great story. Wow. If, you're, if you've studied at CU or walked across the campus, you see his name on the, the <laughs> library building. But how many of us know that p little piece of the yeah. New Orleans history? That's it's, fascinating. It's, 
So. so if I could borrow one of these mics, and Isabella is going to take questions. So if people have questions, she's going to bring this over to you. You kind of oh, uh, you kind of stopped the narrative in 1924, and that's when um, the DA left office. Yes. What what happened in the rest of that decade that brought the Klan under relative control? Um, Part of why I say these people were such opportunists is that they also deserted the Klan almost as rapidly as they came to join it. Um, between 1924 and 1926, there was like a collapse of the Klan in Colorado and also across the country. There were all these scandals involving the leadership. There were, in, there were instances of embezzlement, all sorts of things that exposed the leaders as hypocrites and thieves and things like that. I think also they failed to deliver on many of their promises. Uh, in the Colorado legislature, even though they had the governor and a number of lawmakers, they couldn't get anything through the upper house because there's a group of Senate Republicans who allied with the Democrats against them. And every one of Morley's bills went down in flames. It was the least productive le legislature in history in Colorado. And so by the end of the term, he was a laughing stock. Um, and I, that, that sort of disillusionment was going on across the country. It, it just, it was a very, the, the more they tried to cast their net wide, the more they couldn't deliver on all the things that they were promising. And I think a lot of people got disillusioned with them very quickly. It, yeah, it's interesting in your book, it makes clear that Morley was terrible, and you mentioned this earlier, terrible at governing. He just d had no talent for it. The other thing Locke did is, um, form another group after he, the National Klan kicked him out. He formed a group called the Minutemen. Yes. And um, it had hardly any success at all recruiting. There were all these schisms, basically. I mean, there were a lot of egos involved. He, he decided that he was more important than, I mean, the national leadership was trying to rein him in. And he basically went off convinced that he could lure all the Klansmen into his new group, the Minutemen which we had to wear these revolutionary war uniforms that weren't, I mean, didn't have the simplicity of a nice robe and hood, right? I mean, <laughs> I think the costume was part of what drove them away. But in any case, the Klan became so fragmented because a lot of people went with him to the Minutemen and then they left that and other, the Klansmen who stayed in, it got smaller and smaller until it was just being run by this evangelist out of Canyon City, right? I mean, that was like all that was left of it. So, uh, Patricia, this question's for you. The, um, we've been talking about politics and the sort of larger societal trends. I was struck in your books, um, especially the first one, this young woman travels alone across the country and, and, and confronts um, amazing obstacles and fearful situations. She was very brave. Could you comment on that bravery? That bravery came about after about uh, five or six passes <laughs> through the manuscript. Readers want to cheer for somebody. And so uh, she got tougher and stronger with each edit. <laughs> 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 That's really what happened. <laughs> uh, hi. Many, many of us were stunned at a late, late date to find out the influence that the Klan had in Colorado and in Denver. And it wasn't taught in schools, obviously. Is it being taught in schools now, do you know? Occasionally I will meet at a bookstore, a book signing, uh, somebody who's a history teacher who's saying, oh yes, I'm, I'm teaching that unit now. So I, I don't think it's um, across the board, but it is being taught by some people. You know, history doesn't go away, and uh, we learn so much by looking at it about ourselves then and about ourselves now. And it's interesting when you go back and revisit things that as many museums and countries are doing now of looking back at their past and saying, yes. oh. 
There is a situation um, that occurred in Colorado that I want more people to talk about, and it happened in Lyman. When, I'm going to say 19, early 1900s, when a young 15-year-old black teenager was burned alive at the on a railroad stake, allegedly for um, the murder of a white girl. No evidence. Um, um, he was coerced into a confessing because, as the story goes, if he didn't, he and his father would have been lynched um, as a result of this, this crime. And I think about it, we live near Parker, and uh, 470, it's going that, C470 is going that way, and, and one of the exits is the Lyman, and I, every time I see that sign, I think about that young man and how um, there is a history museum in Lyman, but there's no mention at all of that killing. And um, you're, you're probably aware of that. Oh, yeah, no, I think about that case. Yes. And there's, a, there's, a memorial, there's a memorial now right down by Spear and uh, oh, wow. uh, yeah, the very, the very confluence of Denver where it started. Yeah, that, that's fairly recent. And that's a group of, uh, hooked up with uh, the Equal Justice Initiative. Yes. yes. They've, they've collected dirt out at Lyman that I think has gone back to that area, yes. But that's, that's an amazing story, too, because the media was there. They were practically participants in this. They, they certainly didn't try to stop it. And it was a really horribly shocking and repulsive thing. Uh, Patricia, you indicated that per capita, there was greater numbers of people in Colorado that joined the Klan than in certain other, in many other states. Oh, except um, Indiana. Indiana, my home state. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but I'm wondering if either of you as historians have any guesses as to what it was about Colorado history and culture, society at that time that would make the people of Colorado more open to this kind of appeal. Well, Alan um, mentioned uh, John Galen Locke. He was a showman, and um, you know he wore, he loved the garb and the, um, you know, the medals and the all this uh, array of stuff. And uh, there was that appeal. Um, there was the pressure that I think a lot of people, a lot of businesses especially felt to join the Klan. And um, when it fell apart and people just abandoned it almost wholesale, it, it was interesting to see how quickly, in fact, they rent, left it. So um, there was that. There was the time, you know, this was right after World War I, and people had come back with a, a in, insularity burning in their hearts and f fear of um, wanting to uh, prove their Americanness. Why Colorado? Um, I can't say any more than that. Alan, what do you think? Well, there were some interesting roots to this. There's something called the American Protective Association, which was operating, you have to go back about another generation before this, but there was a very, very anti-Catholic group, and, and Colorado had strong ties to that, and when the national Klan recruiters first came to Colorado, they, they had a little meeting at the Brown Palace, and the person who introduced them was a guy who had been very influential in that group. And it's amazing how many of these, the, the Klan principles, Locke, uh, Morley, uh, Means, all these people who were in high office that were connected with the Klan, had ties to the American Protective Association. A lot of them were Spanish-American war veterans, too. That doesn't mean they actually saw action, but they were part of this same cabal, basically. Um, so there, there, were, there was some, I, I mean, I think you can look at a larger stage of like different issues in Colorado. It's surprising because there's no history of, you know, like the Deep South that you would expect to see, you know, that sort of racial violence that, that you saw elsewhere. but. There was the Sand Creek Massacre. There was, 
incidents of lynching like the one Patricia mentioned. There was the uh, riot in what was Hop Alley back in those days against the Chinese in Denver. Um, I think there had been a series of, of movements of, you know, uh, that had overtones of white supremacy going to them before the Klan came and it just found a very inviting place to sort of fertile soil to work with there. And I don't know if you still have the slides uh, in the deck, but um, uh, uh, yeah. did you still have the slides in the deck? No. Uh -uh. Um, I was asking because one of the slides shows um, a cigar tin from um, a company whose product was spelled um, Cyana, C-Y-A-N-A. And have you ever seen those Sienna cigars? And um, the acronym means uh, Catholics, you are not American. And they developed a, a very slick looking, um, there they are, the Sienna cigars, sold all over uh, six, you know, little shops on 16th Street. The Klan also tried to get a um, pass legislation that would prevent um, um, sacramental wine from being um, served. Did you talk yeah, about that? Yeah, they had, they had uh, that brief period they were in charge. They had a lot of very bold agenda. They they wanted to do a lot of things that were clearly measures against Catholics. Uh, banning sacramental wine because it's a loophole in the prohibition law or something like that. Um, if, if someone's an orphan, they have to attend public school. They were trying to work against the Catholic orphanages. Uh, they were trying to put religion in the schools, their specific brand of Protestantism. Um, the only things they got passed were things like every school has to fly an American flag. I mean, it was really the trivial stuff that they won on, and this other stuff never went anywhere. But some of that was also even stranger. I mean, it never would have got passed. I mean, it wouldn't have survived constitutional scrutiny, like um, banning epileptics from having children. This is like weird eugenic stuff, trying to control, uh, manipulate, you know, breeding. Uh, this is 10 years before Nazi Germany, and they're, st and they're fooling around with that. Do we have? One more question, real quick. Okay. Yeah. So, it um, it's obvious that uh, a lot of money changes hands, right? With membership of these kinds of associations, people having to buy their garb. You mentioned Locke having these like wild um, Minutemen outfits and whatnot. You really do see this with the MAGA movement, that it's very branded, that people want to like ha be identifiable by like their shirt, their hat, their bumper stickers. You know, it's, it's a look, in other words. Um, but at the same time, you know, the Klan kind of fell on its sword by people like misusing these funds. Now, we have the January 6th trial, largest organized crime trial in American history, but it's not leading to the demise of the MAGA movement. It's far more like dispersed. So, I mean, is this a greater threat? <laughs> Somebody writing in the, I think it was a Washington Post yesterday was saying, uh, Trump scares me like crazy. Um, because it is a greater threat, and um, the, um, you know, what, what one could do is to give in and give up, because it does feel bigger and greater, but um, we, we don't give in and give up. We have these talks, and we write letters, and we... Uh, talk to our, 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 the crazy uncle at Thanksgiving who tells the racist jokes. We just, we keep yeah, at it. Try, try to talk to <laughs> I, I try to take heart from Vince Heise's example. Um, 
the, you're correct. I mean, there were tens of millions of dollars raised by the Klan for things like membership dues, and there was never any accountability. And that money clearly got siphoned off at both the local and the, the national level by the leadership. And uh, Van Sys was one of the few people to see this as a criminal enterprise. You know, that they were defrauding their own members in addition to all the other things they were doing, like taking kickbacks from bootleggers and things like that. And I think if he had had the opportunity, uh, you know, it was, it, was, it was difficult enough just trying to finish his term in office and, and, and having to carry a gun every day and all this stuff. But if he'd had the opportunity, I think he would have pursued the criminal prosecution on a lot of these financial fraud charges because it was very much like the con men. I want to thank you both, Alan and Patricia, so much for being here. And I want to point out that um, right now, in a little bit, they will be downstairs signing books in the garage at the room next to registration. If you want to pick up a copies there, I have read them. They're really great reads. So thank you so much. Thank you.